Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you. I want to thank Tess for uh, speaking about Sea Years Home First. She made my job a lot easier uh, in describing the program because I think she gave the overview that we really wanted you to hear. I'm going to give you the more detail y literature, exact, but I think she really alluded to what we were trying to do with the program, and uh, I'd like to thank you for that. Like Rashad, I'm only speaking on behalf of the teams that did the work. Um, I'm part of the group that's evaluating the overall both Saskatoon and Regina pilots, and so we just wanted to share a little bit about um, where we're at and some of um, kind of our thinking behind what's happening. So many of you have heard me talk, particularly around seniors, that the healthcare system really is quite outdated for the needs that we have coming up. While seniors is one example of complex care, this theory applies also to anyone that requires complex care regardless of their age. So whether it's mental health addiction issues, whether it's getting cancer at any age, whatever it is, this model um, that we currently have is, is outdated for managing anyone that does have complex needs. So the perfect storm that's happening in the geriatric world or around older adults is that we have certainly an increase number of people that are baby boomers. So this is from 2011, and you can see this is the blip here. And then right in 2011, according to census, they were about 15% of the Canadian population. And by 2051, they'll be about 25%. And this column is really going to be the future. It's not that, oh, once all the baby boomers get through the system, we'll, we'll be right back to where we were before. This is our new normal. And so we haven't really thought about that in our, in our planning kind of historically around how do we plan for services for older adults. Mixed into there, of course, is the fact that we have a lot of um, families, many families, that are not only smaller, but are geographically dispersed. Not, they're not down the street or in your town or in your neighborhood. So having you know, Tess and her family here has been very, very important for her father, but for many older adults, they either may not have children or may not have children that are able to come and support in the same way. So they're, they're geographically dispersed, and that's really a sign of our times. And then added to that, of course, is this concept of what I think is really a success story of medicine and that people are surviving their heart attacks and their strokes. And when I was trained, which wasn't that long ago, you know, we really were focused on chief complaint, why are they here, and we're aware of maybe one or two or three other conditions that people have, but that's not really what we were focused on. It was treat this condition. What we realize now is that people are accumulating more and more of these, and this model works great if you have two, maybe three other conditions, but once you hit three, four, five, six, the wheels kind of come off that model, it doesn't work anymore, and people start presenting with things like, you know, the term that I really hate, which is failure to thrive, or social admissions, or falls, or things like that, where they're just not doing well, but we don't know why. Yes, maybe their COPD is a bit exacerbated, maybe their CHF, but it's not just that reason. And so we're really moving to a model that is kind of like this, where they're all overlapping and they affect um, multiple different things. And so we really have to shift away from saying, well, we're dealing with their cardiac condition or just their COPD and thinking about how all these other things affect it. And then circling around that is the patient and the context with which the patient lives. What are their supports at home? What is their housing like? Uh, how are they accessing food? How are they getting their medications? How are they taking their medications? So then what that does is it really does push us towards this thinking of team-based care. So we know certainly in um, areas that do a lot of complex care, so whether it's geriatrics, ICU, uh, mental health addictions, that we know success comes from team-based care. So we already know that, and we've proven that time and time again. So now what we're saying is, well, gee, it's not a small percentage of the population that those teams have to serve. That's actually everybody in the hospital now. That's a lot of people in our system, and that's certainly the people that are coming in and out of eMERGE a lot, people that are staying in the hospital for a long time, people who are coming frequently to their family physicians, and certainly people that we are managing with home care. So if, if that's now not a small portion where these specialized teams can manage them, we really have to move that model to saying, how do we do team-based care throughout the system? And that really is kind of the impetus of, of why we've moved to uh, this model. So when, then we said, okay, uh, if I go back here, all of these two things are happening in what I call an outdated, overflowing uh, system that really was created for episodic care. You know, primary care was to manage you, and then if something really bad happened, you were supposed to go to the hospital for catastrophic care. But we haven't. We've defaulted to the hospital because we were missing 
pieces in this model, and we're trying to figure out what to do. And what I keep telling people is that our oldest baby boomer is 71. So they're not even it really in our healthcare system yet. Most of the high users in our healthcare system, from a geriatric point of view, are those that are 75 and 80. That's really when that multimorbidity starts really impacting individuals and they become a lot more frail and unable to tolerate um, minor changes. So the system isn't ready um, and what we have right now in our overflowing system are not even the people that are coming in the next five to 10 years. So when we said, let's try to figure out what those unmet needs are, we started by looking at the most obvious. We know that there is so much unmet need, but just even to figure out what those are, what are the unmet needs for intermediate care? What are the unmet needs for community? We don't have a way to really figure that out fully. So we said, let's start with ALC, because those are the most obvious. Those are the people that are in the hospital who are stuck there because we don't have an, an alternative for them. So let's start with that data, recognizing, of course, that we need to be looking at trying to figure out what is the unmet needs from a public health point of view, from primary care, from hot spotting, from community care, and, and, and end of life care. And using that data then to determine do we have enough of whatever existing resources, so long term care, certain things like that, or are we even using the right models based on what those needs are? So while we were going to sort through all this stuff, a couple years ago, the ministry announced some funding. And they said, well, we'd like to fund um, senior home visits. We'd like to fund some, program some pilots for people to go out, uh, for a team to go out and visit patients in their home, particularly homebound seniors. So you know, those of us in the senior world were very excited and said, of course, we'll take your money and do whatever we can for older adults. But we started looking at it. The model that they had initially thought was based on a, a really great uh, model by one of my colleagues in Toronto where they actually have a primary care team that does all of their care and they actually go into their homes. Um, if people are interested, they actually won uh, an award. They filmed it as a national film board thing and so I encourage any of those to look at that. It's quite interesting. But that really wasn't something that we could do with the, con with the infrastructure that we had in place here in Saskatoon and Regina. So then we said, okay, what should we do? So we went to the literature and quickly we realized that one of the big missing pieces, and what we've tried to introduce kind of um, as a, a new concept, is this concept of intermediate care. So between acute care here and here, and community care here and here, and this is a slide from Scotland. So in Australia and in England and in Scotland, they're starting to talk a lot more about this. And what they th saw of intermediate care is a step up. So from home, you step up into intermediate care instead of having to default to the hospital. And from the hospital, you would step down to intermediate care before you need to go home. So that, that intermediate care can either be bed-based, so rehab units, um, sh uh, units where you might uh, reablement units where we get stronger, or they may be home-based ones. So we said, oh, well, that's interesting. I think that that's something that we could do is this concept of home-based intermediate care. That is kind of what the uh, ministry had wanted us to do is to provide care in patients' homes for seniors. So the next thing we do, and this slide is very busy, but I, we went to the literature and we looked at all these different types of care in the community. So the bed-based intermediate, which we already talked about. What were the programs that you could pull from acute care? And underneath here, in really light writing, and I'm happy to share if people want it, are all the examples of all these different types of programs that have been proven in the literature. So rapid response, short-term teams, longer-term management of complex high-risk patients. So in here is like your chronic disease management. Obviously, a lot of the changes that are happening in primary care, so the patient medical home, for instance, and then around wellness, so public health, social isolation, all those things. So we said, well, gee, that's a lot of stuff to do. So we targeted in and we said, taking the evidence, taking what we know, um, let's figure out what we can do. So what we did was we tried to pull in primary care, so really thinking about as we develop these pilots, how do we link to the family physicians and the primary care teams. Geriatrics for Saskatoon, where we do have a geriatric program here. Home and community care, obviously, and then acute care. So really thinking about this whole structure and trying to create a pilot. So the pilot was started in Regina and Saskatoon. Um, slightly different approaches, slightly different funding models. 
but the core concepts were this idea of interdisciplinary teams. Very quickly, again, we realized with the funding that we had that the programs in themselves couldn't really do it. We didn't want to create yet another isolated, siloed program. So there was a lot of communication around how do we link with existing resources that are already there, so paramedicine programs, Home First that had already been funded, and certainly home care that was also in existence and already doing a lot of great work out in the community. How do we partner and start figuring out what are some of their obvious gaps and, and what do we do? We also did um, a little bit of work in Saskatoon because we had the program here around training that team. So really spending some time with them up front and training them on geriatric core competencies. So understanding approach to polypharmacy, approach to falls, um, multimorbidity, things like that. And the areas that we focused on, again, were based on the literature to say, what could we do to avoid going to the hospital and being admitted? What could we do to pull people out a bit earlier, what the literature calls early facilitated discharge? And then really thinking about those care transitions, because as Rashad was saying, high quality care transitions, um, a lot of those elements are done by those intermediate care teams. They're the ones that enable it, and much of that literature was based on those types of teams. What we also found when we started looking at as, as the teams were developing was that we were recognizing a need for palliative care. So some of it was uh, cancer-related end-of-life care, but a lot of it was end-stage COPD, end-stage heart failure, because we don't, again, really have good alternatives. So what we end up doing is sending back and forth uh, to emergency. And part of that was around that advanced care planning, which you'll see is also in the high-quality care transitions. So the evaluation is underway, we're almost done. It, it, it was a lot harder to evaluate than we thought, partly because it was a true PDSA. Like we kept changing what the teams did, who, who we focused on, where they were located. You know, there was org structure changes. So it was a constant uh, evolution. And so to really have a stable population that you could really evaluate was a bit of a challenge. But what we already know from our preliminary look is that we're, uh, we're having a definite impact on the amount of ED visits for the patients that have been seen by the program. So the number of times they go back to the eMERGE has significantly decreased. And if they are admitted, we think that there's a trend that's showing that that's decreasing. And should they be admitted again, then the length of stay is shorter. And we're just waiting for the data now to say, for the ones that we pulled out, um, did we shorten their length of stay, which we assume we did, but much harder to collect. So stay tuned, those results are coming. Um, what we what we learned so far from this process is that change takes time. Not only are you rejigging and moving people, um, we are changing roles and how people traditionally have seen their roles and how they've worked together. Um, there is also a lot of moving pieces that also have to be restructured, so everything from reporting, who do you report to, things like that. We also know that the service has to be available seven days a week. Um, Saskatoon, for instance, started as five day a week. I think Regina did as well. And we're realizing that we can't start this service and then say, well, you're on your own for two days. And so we were really pulling home care and primary care in to uh, coordinate that when it would have been easier if it had been seven days a week. Co-location of the team was quite critical. We are talking about how do these teams work together. Putting them together in itself is not enough. It at least is a start to be able to have those conversations to say, what are you doing? And if you're going out, can you um, check on this and things like that? And then really is around how do you work as a team? We also know that education around whatever the particular needs of the patients that you're serving. So in this particular pilot, so it was really around geriatrics. And we, we spent a lot of time um, really uh, during case reviews, doing education as well to really bolster that. And we're doing some work um, in Regina now to help their teams uh, increase their knowledge around geriatrics as well. Uh, we found that the palette of care knowledge, so even for someone like myself who's a geriatrician and an internist having worked, you know, fair scope, that was even an area that um, it was really great to have Trish, who um, we heard about earlier, uh, who had, did extra training in palliative of care, be there to, to help the rest of us learn more about that. Communication was a big pain in the butt, and so we really have to focus on figuring out how do we communicate. So we have various different team members that chart in various different forms, everything from paper to electronic health records to community procura records to, you know, I'm not sure what else, but they were everywhere, and so we had no centralized way of being able to do that. So we know that this is a backbone to high quality care transitions, but it's also a backbone to how teams work, uh, particularly, I think, in um, areas where you're not on a unit per se. So if you're in a geographical uh, network or in a smaller community where you may be, your team may be spread out over a larger geographical area. 
We also know that the results are better if we target. So as I said at the beginning, we looked at you know, what can we do to prevent admissions, what can we do to pull out patients, what can we do for palliative care, and it really did spread the team and spread some of the results. So you know, one of the learnings there is to really think about focusing on where we would make the most impact and it looks like right now as we found out in the modeling that's certainly pulling people out of ALC but what we noticed from that is not only did that shorten the length of stay in hospital but it actually did reduce those admissions or ER utilization and readmission so you are having an impact on the whole cycle. The last thing of course is that we need to link with other services. I think like what Rashad showed in his diagram is that as we keep evolving, it's coming more and more clear that we probably will just become network teams rather than a senior first team, a connected to care team, a hot spotting team, a this team, a that team. We probably will develop these networks and we will be a network team that will just, you know, ebb and flow according to the needs of those that we serve. So the next steps for um, the senior home visit team, of course, is to work with um, what's happening in the community teams and the networking. There is, uh, the senior home visit teams uh, really did were kind of that bridge. They were in acute care where they would identify patients that could come out of hospital earlier, provided that transitional support and intermediate care, and then handed it back to primary care. So what we're wanting to do now is to really smooth that flow out a little bit better, understand it a bit better, but in the context of what these networks are going to be. Uh, we're wanting to use the ALC data, so these are just some examples of some of the results that we have on ALC data, which is already showing us, for instance, you know, a significant percentage of um, patients in the hospital, so 23%, I believe, is what we have from some of the older data, and again, this is the age distribution, so a lot of older adults there, and then this is a breakdown of the reasons why, and about 50, 60% are all functional impairments, so it's allowing us to say, what type of team members do we need uh, in these teams so that we can provide the type of intermediate care that is needed in that network. So we're, we're, we're starting to adjust the teams accordingly as we move forward. We're also uh, working on a better communication plan and there's some work um, that is globally going on throughout the province on that. Some more education and some ongoing evaluation and continuous quality improvement. So that's it. Thank you.